The basics of rose hybridization, from collecting pollen to registering a new cultivar. Hello, my name is Nate Fisher. I'm a past president of Lehigh Valley Rose Society, an ARS Consulting Rosarian, the 2021 ARS Rising Star Award recipient, an incubator farmer at the Seed Farm. I formulated and registered an all-natural and organic rose fertilizer, and in 2022, I started hybridizing my own roses. I have 103 roses in my personal rose garden, with another 42 on the way. I've also designed the Hopewell Park Rose Garden. Selecting the parents. When you think of the ideal rose, what qualities come to mind? Are you looking for a rose with a strong scent? Perhaps you're looking for a specific scent. A traditional old garden rose scent or something like lemons, apricot, or myrrh. Maybe scent isn't too important to you, and your main concern is a rose that has a good exhibition bloom. Maybe you aren't a fan of the traditional rose form and prefer a very open, cupped bloom. Perhaps vase life is more important to you. Many want a unique or specific color. Some purchase white roses in honor of loved ones that have passed away. Others are drawn to a striped rose or a purple rose or mauve. We, in the Lehigh Valley, live in Zone 6B. There are a fair number of roses that cannot tolerate our winters. Conversely, there are some roses that cannot tolerate the southern Florida or Texas or Arizona temperatures. One of the most sought-after traits is disease resistance. This is being studied across the world by places like Texas A&M's Rose Genetics Program. Disease resistance is on nearly every hybridizer's checklist these days, though that was not always the case. Consideration is taken by the breeder for their own personal preferences, crossed with whatever they think would do well in their targeted market. This influences the paths breeders take with the parent roses they wind up selecting. Most rose breeders determine some specific traits that they are looking for and then start to research potential parent plants based off of that. In their research, they look at not just the specific rose, but its own ancestry, as well as to see which specific traits seem to be dominant. Many independent rose breeders readily share data on which roses have been good pollen parents, resulting in higher germination rates, which seeds parents readily set hips, and other details like this that serve as a good starting point for research. The Rose Hybridizers Association has two publications, Rose Hybridizing for Beginners, which this list on the slide is from that publication, which was published in 1989, and Rose Hybridizing the Next Step, which serves as an invaluable resources. There's also an associated online forum and a Facebook group that are very helpful as well. This list of good seed parents is from the Rose Hybridizers Association's more recent publication, Rose Hybridizing the Next Step, which was released in 2013. I've removed some of the duplicates from their 1989 list. What's important to note is that oftentimes the good qualities of a cultivar will pass down for several generations. An example of this is the fragrance of Fragrant Cloud has been passed down to its more recent offspring, Dolly Parton. This is where research comes into play. A helpful website called Help Me Find can help you find more recent offspring of roses that may no longer be in commerce, but have a proven track record. For my own personal rose breeding, so far I've found Tottering by Gently, The Generous Gardener, and Florentina to be my top seed parents in terms of number of rose hips, number of seeds per hip, and germination percentage. Flower anatomy. This is a photo I took of tottering by gently in my yard in September of 2022. Looking at this photo, the anther is attached to the filament, and those two parts combined are called the stamen, which is the male part of the bloom. Pollen, the yellow powder-like grains, are formed in the anther. I'm going to reference this photo in a couple of slides, so I want you to take note of the color and the um, appearance in general of the anthers in this photo. The female part of the bloom is called the pistil. 
It consists of the stigma, which is pictured with um, an arrow in the picture, the style, which is difficult to see in this photo, but the red bundle um, under the stigma where the arrow is pointing, the ovary and the ovule. Unfortunately, in this photo, you cannot see all of the female parts. On this slide are the definitions for the various parts of a flower, both seen and unseen from the previous photo. So the male part, again, is called the stamen, which consists of a filament and an anther, which produces male germ cells carried in pollen grains. Interestingly, the inside of the pollen grain is actually liquid, and that is where the germ cells are located. The anther is an organ born at the upper end of a stamen that generates and discharges the ripened pollen. The filament is the stalk of the stamen, which bears the anther, and the pollen again is the yellow powder-like grains which are formed in the anther, which can contain the male germ cells. On the female side, the pistil is the female reproductive organ composed of stigma, style, and ovary, which produces female germ cells and bears the seed. A pistil is actually composed of multiple carpels. The carpel is just one section of the pistil consisting of one stigma, style, ovary, and ovule. The stigma is the surface of the pistil on which the pollen grains are deposited in the process of pollination. The style is one of a bundle of slender columns through which the pollen passes from the stigma to the ovary. The ovary is the enlarged base of the pistil in which the seed develops, and the ovule is the female germ cell. There are several more parts to a rose, um, but that doesn't fall within the scope of this presentation, just in case you're wondering, like, where's the rest of it? Collecting pollen. Pollen can be collected either from blooms that have been left on the rose bush or from cut blooms. Select a bloom early in the morning that is partially open. I find it easiest to remove the anthers with a pair of tweezers by pinching the filaments. Carefully let them fall onto a sheet of wax paper as you pinch them off, then dump the anthers into a clear container like a baby food jar. Try to keep the anthers uh, separated in a flat layer, not stacked up on top of each other as best as possible which um, helps to allow them to dry out. Um, you want to allow them to sit for about 24 hours in a warm and dry location. Once the pollen has ripened, swirl the anthers in the jar vigorously. The goal is to get the pollen to stick to the bottom and the sides of the jar. The anthers must then be removed to prevent mold during storage. Some people prefer to cut off the entire bloom Remove the petals, lay it on a piece of wax paper for 24 hours, then shake it out onto the paper. Once the pollen is shaken onto the paper, they carefully transfer it to a jar. It's really personal preference which way you prefer. Um, it is best to use the pollen right away, but it can be stored in the fridge for two to four weeks or in a freezer indefinitely. Be sure to label your pollen, which rose the pollen came from, and um, so you're able to keep accurate records of your crosses. Preparing the seed parent. Starting early in the morning, you want to carefully remove all of the petals from the bloom. It is essential that the bloom be not too far along that the stamens are mature, uh, releasing their own pollen. A way to check for this is simply to touch the anthers carefully with your fingertips and see if any pollen transfers to your finger. If it does, then there's a risk that it has already been pollinated by itself. So you want to move to a different bloom. Carefully remove the stamens from the bloom. You can use your fingers, a pair of tweezers, or a knife and your thumb, whichever works best for you. My personal preference is to use tweezers. You can save the anthers that you've just removed if you'd like to then collect the pollen from them once ripened. Um, I just want to point out in this photo, this bloom looks like tottering by gently. The photo is from David Austin Roses. 
um, notice the difference between this photo and my photo from a couple of slides ago. The anthers in my photo looked brown and dried out. They were old and had already released their pollen. These are bright yellow, new, and they have not yet released their pollen. You then apply the pollen that you've previously collected to the stigma, and you want to use a generous amount. You can use your finger, which I prefer not to, a Q-tip, which is probably the easiest option, or a small brush. I prefer to use a brush. Um, if you do use a brush, make sure to use a natural bristle, like ox hair or camel hair, as pollen does not stick well to artificial bristles. Um, you must sterilize or uh, discard whatever you use in between using different varieties pollens. This is where it's probably easier to use a Q-tip because you can just throw it away and grab a new one each time you change different to different pollen. Um, but to sterilize a brush, you want to use either ethanol or isopropyl alcohol and dry it thoroughly. If you don't dry it thoroughly, the alcohol will wind up sterilizing the pollen. If you have enough pollen, you can repeat your pollination up to three days in a row to assure fertilization. After pollination, you may want to loosely cover your blooms to protect the pollen from wind, water, sun, um, insects, or to ex and also to extend the pollen's viability. Um, you want to make sure not to use anything plastic, though. The rose hip. If your pollination has been successful, in about two weeks, you'll see the base of the bloom start to enlarge, eventually forming the familiar rose hip. Rose hips typically mature in about 90 to 120 days. Over time, they change color to yellow, orange, red, reddish brown, purple, or um, even olive green, depending on the seed parent. Once the rose hip has ripened, you can cut it off from the rose. I place all of the hips from the same cross into a Ziploc bag labeled with that specific cross as a temporary means of storage. When I'm ready to get the seeds harvested, I go one bag at a time, cutting open the hips and removing the seeds. You don't actually have to worry about being careful at this step. The seeds are strong and won't cut through them. If you do cut through them, they're no good. You want to make sure that the seeds are clean of any fleshy material. A fun fact, if you look closely at these photos, you'll see this like hair looking substance on the cutting board. Those little hairs can actually be used to make an itching powder. Tracking data. This is where my OCD heart is a flutter. I love collecting data. There are some rose breeders that keep virtually no data. They just create crosses, harvest hips, collect seeds, stratify them, plant them in trays, and hope for the best. I couldn't do that. I keep track of the number of the same crosses attempted. For example, how many tottering by gently blooms did I pollinate with lemon fizz pollen? I then count the number of those crosses that resulted in a rose hip to determine a pollination rate for that specific cross. When harvesting the seeds, I count up the total number of seeds from each rose hip with a specific rose cross. I then divide that number by the total number of rose hips from that cross to determine an average number of seeds from each specific cross. Once the seeds are planted, I keep track of how many germinate from a specific cross. By dividing this number by the total number of seeds in a cross, I can determine a germination rate for a specific cross. In order to keep all of this data more manageable, I've come up with a code for each pollen parent and a code for each seed parent. Many rose hybridizers do this, and they all have different methods of, of labeling their crosses. Uh, I start with the year, then the seed parent, which is always first, then the pollen parent, then the hip number, then the seed number from that specific hip. As the seedlings progress, I'll be able to collect more data on growth habit, bloom form, color, 
disease resistance, and other information. Um, keeping track of all of this data helps uh, not just when culling seedlings, it also helps to determine which desirable traits are coming from where, and it helps to inform a decision on new crosses to try out. This can help to improve germination rates and give me more viable seedlings to work with. In my first year, I wound up with 2,464 seeds from a total of 288 hips. Cold stratification. Cold stratification is a period of time where seeds are sto stored in cold temperatures to be allowed to mature and it is intended to improve germination rates. Once seeds have been properly entered into my spreadsheet, counted and cleaned, they are then soaked in a fungicide solution. While being soaked, you can do what is called a float test. It's said that seeds that sink to the bottom are more likely to germinate than the seeds that float. Some rose hybridizers discard any floating seeds. Um, given that this was my first year, I basically wanted to plant anything and everything to give me the best chance of something growing. I took each set of seeds from a particular hip and once soaked in the fungicide solution, placed them into a plastic sandwich bag with a piece of paper towel that was soaked in the fungicide solution as well and wrung out so that it was moist but not dripping with water. Just as an added precaution, I used distilled water for the fungicide solution. Um, this process was incredibly tedious for the number of hips and seeds that I had. Each baggie was labeled with the first four data points from the code that I have created, um, basically everything minus the specific seed number since all seeds from the same hip were put into one bag. An individual seed was not assigned a seed number until I planted it into germination tray cells. Um, once the seeds were ready, I put the baggies into our kitchen fridge to cold stratify. Um, they can be stored for two to three months, um, kept at a temperature between 35 and 45 degrees. Some seeds may begin to germinate in the fridge after about six weeks, so it's important to periodically check on them and plant ones that germinate as soon as possible for best results. Seeds to seedlings. The next step for me was a bit of a headache. <laughs> I had some spare wire metal shelving units, uh, but I needed germination trays, the 1020 flats, grow lights, heat mats, and timers. So I ordered all of those supplies from Amazon. Um, I knew I wanted to set up this grow station in my basement, but I needed to have an outlet installed. Uh, the only outlets we had were for our washer and for our dryer and for our freezer on the other side of the basement. Um, Luckily, there was plenty of empty spaces on our breaker panel, and the place that I wanted to put this first station was right next to the breaker box. Um, so I called an electrician. After two weeks, he came out, looked at all of the grow lights and heat mats, and looked at what they were rated, and said, you should have two dedicated 20-amp breakers added for all of this stuff. So something that I was expecting to be a couple hundred dollars wound up being quite a bit more. Um, I bought some chains and S-hooks at Home Depot. Uh, I cut the chains to uh, about 18 inches, um, and they're small lengths, so they can be longer or shorter in like one inch increments or so. Um, I added the S-hooks so that I could make the grow lights height adjustable on the shelves. I put all of the grow lights on timers, and the heat mats actually came with thermostats. Um, with a probe that goes into the soil to measure the soil temperature. With how mild of a winter we've had this year, our basement hasn't gotten as cold as I was expecting it to, so I don't even think that the heat mats actually wound up turning on. I had them set to 55 degrees, which is the ideal temperature for germination. Um, germination slows significantly when the soil temperature is either above 70, 70 degrees or below... 45 degrees. The first seedling that I found had actually germinated in the fridge. So here um, it's pictured being planted in the cell um, and it's sticking up before I added the perlite layer on top. 
here are some photos of seedling progression. Um, the seeds were planted in a fox farm potting mix. A layer of perlite was added to the top of each cell in an effort to prevent the top layer from being too moist. Um, this reduces the possibility of damping off, which rose seedlings are pretty susceptible to. Uh, the picture on the left, um, those three uh, seedlings there had all germinated in the fridge. Um, they're all from Florentina, which so far, all of my um, seeds from Florentina as the seed parent have had something like a 60% germination rate, which is, for roses, extraordinary. Um, the bottom right picture, I believe, is those same seedlings um, maybe two weeks later. Here are some close-up photos taken of more of the rose seedlings. <clears throat> and then this is the setup that I put together in our basement. Um, the grow lights are supposed to be turned on once the first seedling emerges and are set on timers to be on 15 hours per day. They are set to be four inches up from the top of the tallest seedling on that shelf. And then they can be adjusted um, closer to the top of the shelf so that they're further away from the seedlings as the seedlings grow taller. Um, this photo is taken part way through planting all of my rose seeds. This picture was taken after the first 1600 seeds had been planted into their individual cells. Once the seedling's first set of true leaves shows, you want to transplant it from the germination tray into something larger. The first two leaves that appear when the seedling emerges are called the cotyledon. They supply the embryo plant with the food required for initial growth. They're rounded and kind of smooth. Um, it's pretty easy to tell the leaves apart from the rose's true leaves. The taproot on the rose seedlings develops rather quickly, so you don't want to wait too long before transplanting it or you risk damaging it. In the picture on the left, you can see how long they can get. Um, and that's a substantial amount of root growth for um, you know, how long they were in the seed trays. Um, as the seedlings show their first set of true leaves, I transplant them into three inch peat pots and I write up a plant label to identify that seedling which is seen in the pictures on the right, those white labels there. Um, seedlings are especially susceptible to spider mites and mildew, so you want to treat with miticides and fungicides. Um, these will grow indoors for a while, and then after a period of hardening off outside on sunny days, they'll be able to be planted outside to grow in ground. You have a good rose, now what? So once you have a rose that you like well enough that you'd like to potentially enter it into commerce and register it, you need to make copies of it. There are two ways to go about doing this. One way is grafting, and another way is propagating. I personally will be air layering my roses, which is a method of propagating, so that will be detailed in the following slides. First, you want to cut a section um, of about five to eight inches, uh, free of, of thorns and leaves on a cane, and at least um, have that cane at least as thick as a pencil. Then very carefully, about a quarter inch below a leaf node, you want to make a superficial cut around the cane, as well as an identical cut one inch below that. Very carefully, you want to remove the green flown tissue to get down to white wood. You don't want to cut too deeply and risk breaking the cane. On the girdled section, you want to brush rooting hormone to encourage the growth of roots. Um, I will be using root pods rather than the plastic baggies and zip ties that are typically used. Um, root pods were specifically designed for this uh, purpose. So um, you'll want to fill each side of the root pod with wet but not dripping wet peat potting mix. Um, in about three weeks, White roots should start to show. At that point, it's helpful to add a weak liquid fertilizer to the pod. In about six weeks, it should be full of roots and ready to plant. You want to cut the cane just below the pod. 
trim the upper cane to about eight inches tall, leaving several leaf nodes, but removing all the leaves. In about one to two weeks, you should start to see new leaves grow. The alternative to propagating a rose is grafting it. Basically, you take the rose you want and attach it to the roots of a different rose. This different rose is called the rootstock. The three most common rootstocks we see are Dr. Huey, Fortuniana, and Multiflora. Fortuniana is used primarily in warmer parts of the country. It's very vigorous and does well in sandy soil, but it's not very cold hardy. It is tolerant to nematodes, a um, common pest in Florida that invades roots. Dr. Huey is the most commonly used rootstock. It has a long budding season. It stores well bare rooted and it performs fairly, consistent, fairly consistently across the US, which is why a lot of the larger growers choose to use that because they ship across the US. Um, Multiflora has a tendency to pick up salts and it's not very happy in alpine soil, but this is the rootstock that typically does the best in our area. <clears throat> so there are pros um, and cons in grafting. Um, so grafting has been the primary method of producing roses ever since the first hybrid tea rose was introduced in the late 1800s. La France um, had a beautiful bloom, but the plant itself was weak. By budding it onto rootstock, it took on more vigor, and budding soon became the method of producing the modern rose. This type of growth um, provides more instant gratification. It's being sold at a larger size. Um, you know, typically you can get them in like a three gallon pot um, compared to own root roses, which you know, may come in like a band size pot or a one gallon pot. Um, some cons uh, to grafting roses are that uh, grafted roses tend to have a shorter life expectancy than own root roses. Um, over time, a grafted rose will outgrow the bud union and need to be replaced. The bud union itself can become quite large and kind of unsightly. Um, grafted roses have less winter hardiness and disease resistance and are typically more susceptible to rose viruses and they have a tendency to sucker, which is um, uh, sending out growth from the rootstock rather than the rose that you actually want. And then that winds up taking over and then the, the rose that you've planted dies and then you're left with the rootstock. So a grafting how-to. First, you wanna take a mature uh, rootstock plant and you cut a T-shaped incision into the bark. A bud from the rose that you want is placed into the cut and is then wrapped securely until it heals. Once the graft takes, the upper branching of the rootstock is cut off, which uh, leaves just the graft bud to grow and that eventually forms the new rose bush. In this photo, you can see the T-shaped incision. Um, in the photo on the left, you can see the bud selected from the rose that will be grafted onto the rootstock. In the upper right photo, it's been carefully cut off of the cane, almost like peeled off. It's not the entire cane, like that section of the cane cut out. It's, it's almost like, like a skin graft almost. It's just like a, a light peel. Um, in the bottom right photo, it's been slid into the incision on the rootstock. In the photo on the left, it's been wrapped tightly in tape to leave it to heal. And then in the photo on the right, the tape has been removed and the bud has sent out new growth. At this point, it can be cut basically where the red line is drawn to remove the upper portion of the rootstock. Registering your rose. You have your rose, you've made copies of it, you've been growing it for a couple of years and are happy with how it performs, how it looks, uh, its disease hardiness and, and, and its um, pest resistance. You've decided that you wanna register a name for it. How and where do you do that? 
the American Rose Society actually serves as the International Cultivar Registration Authority for Roses by appointment of the International Society for Horticultural Sciences. ARS handles the registration of new rose cultivars and maintains a database of registered roses. This database consists of more than 37,000 rose registrations that have been submitted starting all the way back in 1930. By reaching out to ARS, you will be assigned a rose breeder code. It is typically the first three letters of your last name or company, uh, unless that is currently being used. Some examples are KOR for Cortez Roses, MEI for Mayant Roses, RAD for Will Radler's Roses. Um, I've been assigned the code FIS, which actually had been in use uh, at least two times previously, once in the 1950s and once again for someone who registered one found rose in the late 90s. Both people at this point, I believe, have passed away. To enter a new rose, you visit the Modern Roses database, and you need to be prepared to enter the registration name, the exhibition name, um, your breeder name and details, they ask about your email address and things like that, um, introduction year, color class, ARS horticulture class, bloom size, petal count, bloom habit, full age color, growth habit, photo, parentage, and all sorts of other details that are pictured in this photo. All right, so um, that is the presentation, and I will be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you for your time.